As I mentioned last week when we covered chapter 3, that chapter and this chapter that we're covering, chapter 4, is essentially one entire story. They're linked together. Last week when we did cover chapter 3, we saw the nation of Israel finally begin to cross over the Jordan in order to take into their possession the promised land. So there in chapter 3, we're told that God led them. He led them by way of the Ark of the Covenant to the river. And then he displayed his awesome and wondrous power when he stopped the flow of the Jordan River. Again, it was at peak flood stage, so it wasn't just a tiny stream. It was a huge river. But he stopped the flow of the river until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now, for Israel, the crossing of the Jordan meant a couple of things. First, they were now irrevocably committed to a struggle against armies, chariots, and fortified cities. And second, they were also committed to walk by faith in the living God and no longer walk according to the flesh, just as they did in the wilderness. For us as believers, the story of the crossing of the Jordan taught us a couple of things. One, that it represents the end of life lived by human effort and the beginning of a life lived of life of faith and obedience. And two, the only way to achieve redemptive success before God is by following Christ, following his son, our leader and Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now again, I got more into detail about those things. (coughs) If you didn't hear last week's message, I recommend you go back and listen to Joshua chapter 3. But now, as we continue on uh, this story in chapter 4, the emphasis will now be, well, the emphasis last week was on crossing the Jordan River. Well, this week's emphasis will be coming up out of the river, coming out of the river, and now into the promised land. We're going to read about some specific instructions that were given for the memorializing of this event and an explanation to its importance. But here's in general, here overall, what I believe the main idea, the main message will be will be this. It's going to show us that as believers, as a believer, God saves you through faith in the Son and sends us the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead so that we may declare His excellencies to a world that doesn't know Him. So before we begin reading the first part of our passage, let's pray and thank the Lord bringing us here for his word. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior, our Lord, our God, for being, for showing us the grace and mercy of God the Father. Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be here, to come together as a church in order to hear from you, to learn from you, and to grow in our relationship with you. So now as we get into your word, I pray that it will speak powerfully into our lives, into the lives of everyone that's here, everyone that's watching this live or watching this later on or listening to it later later on, Lord. I pray that you change lives. You will minister to those who need to be ministered, heal those that need to be healed, and comfort those that need to be comforted. And also rebuke 
anybody that needs to be rebuked. Lord, we trust in you, believe in you, we glorify you, we praise you, and now as we sit at your feet, just want to worship you more as we read your word. So fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Keep us safe. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. The word of God says, After the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, Choose twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, Take twelve stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the priests are standing. Carry them with you and set them down at the place where you spend the night. <coughs> So Joshua summoned the 12 men he had selected from the Israelites, one man for each tribe. He said to them, go across to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you lift a stone into, onto his shoulder, one for each of the Israelite tribes, so that this will be a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these, what do these stones mean to you? You should tell them the water of the Jordan was cut off in front of the ark of the Lord's covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the Jordan's water was cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a, a memorial for the Israelites. The Israelites did just as Joshua had commanded them. The 12 men took the stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each of the Israelite tribes, just as the Lord had told Joshua. Carried them, they carried them to the camp and set, the de- set them down there. Joshua also set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan where the priests who carried the Ark of the con- Covenant were standing. The stones are still there today. The priests carrying the Ark continued standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people in keeping with all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people hurried across, and after everyone had finished crossing, the priest with the ark of the Lord crossed in the sight of the people. The Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh went in battle formation in front of the Israelites as Moses had instructed them. About 45,000 equipped for war crossed into the plains of Jericho, into the plains of Jericho in the Lord's presence. As you can see, chapter 4 begins immediately right after the moment the Israelites had finished crossing the Jordan. But this miraculous wonderful, great event was too important, it was way too important for the people just to simply forget about it, to, for it to be something that people forgot later on down after a few generations. Therefore, to commemorate this historic day, God had them erect a 12-stone memorial. So the Lord told Joshua to direct 12 men that he had previously, chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that were previously chosen to, to carry 12 stones from the bed of the river to the place where they're going to be camped out that night, for the night. So Joshua did exactly what the Lord had commanded him and instructed the 12 men to return to the middle of the riverbed and had them each bring back one stone. These must have been pretty big stones because we're told that they were hauling them on their shoulders. They just weren't hauling them in their hands. They were hauling them on their shoulders. So therefore, um, it seems like they were pretty big stones. When they, uh, then they were to place all stone, all those 12 stones into a heap to serve as a memorial 
so that the people of Israel could teach their children about the great things God had done that day. So that the work of God wouldn't be forgotten among the generations. The Israelites, you see, were to tell, were to tell the story. And these stones were stones with a story. Imagine now if these, storm, if these stones could come to life and talk. What would their story be? What would they say? Well, my friends, believe this anticip- I believe this anticipates what Jesus will say to the religious leaders who objected to the vocal and physical excitement of the people's joy when they saw Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. What we know today is Palm Sunday. In Luke 19, chapter 19, verse 39, the religious leaders told, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, stop them from all this ruckus. Stop them from, you know, all these, you know, vocal celebrations, from all these, all these praises. And see, they were asking Jesus to just tell his disciples to just shut up. Well, what was Jesus' response? He said this in the following verse, in verse 40. I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out which might alternately be translated, if it were possible for these disciples to remain silent, then rocks would protest and walk a picket line with a loud chant. See what I'm saying there? Can you picture that? Can you imagine that or just what that might look like? We sing here at the church, praise to songs of praise and worship to God. And there are many other people all around the world who are doing this on a regular and consistent basis. But here's the thing, that when these songs of praises and worship are going out to God, Stones are like, yeah, go ahead and sing them. We don't want to be out there crying out loud. And I guess what I'm saying is, if you don't understand what I'm saying, like if everybody, for some reason, every Christian just stopped praising and worshiping and glorifying Jesus, stones would have to cry out. Stones would have to cry out. It's mind-blowing. You know, I, I remember watching this YouTube short clip video, or this video, short clip. Someone had a, had a rock, and they had like a, some kind of sound machine connected to it, and they were rotating the rock. And it was making like these sound waves, these, these, these sounds that I was like, no way, this rock is making sounds. This rock, I guess in a sense, is praising and glorifying God. But it was just amazing. So again, we can't, as people, as God's children, should be within us, within all of us, to want to glorify and praise God. The rocks will do it. How much more should we? And also, let me also just tell you what we see in these verses as well. As a church, we have to tell the story. We have to tell the story. Our unified 
story, the story of how this church came to be, how Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel came to be. Did you know that before this church was called Fresh Vision, Calvary Chapel was known as Fresh Vision Church? There's a reason why we added Calvary Chapel. There's a story behind everything in this church, from this pulpit to these chairs to tables, everything. Everything has a story. And it goes all the way back to carrying totes every Sunday morning to that conference room, into that conference room at the hotel room. But, yeah, we have a story here, a unified story that needs to be told about. Elie Weissel, a Jewish Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner, was asked how the Jewish people could retain the history of the Holocaust. Elie Weissel explained that he believed in the power, the power of retelling the story. This story is for all of God's people. Many churches often fail because older generations don't talk about those stories. Don't tell the younger generations how powerfully God moved, did move, is moving. They don't tell the younger generations about the history of that church. They don't tell the younger generations the history of the church in general. And so what happens is that those younger generations, those young people, they forget They forget because they've never been told how great God is and how real His working is in our lives. Similarly, as believers, we often fail in our trust in God because we forget the great things He's done. I, I, again, I can't help but to, to... when things are down, when things are going hard, when things are hard, and I do, I remember the great things that God has done in my life. Do you do the same? Do you, when things are difficult, when things are hard, when things seem, when God seems far away and distance, distant, and he seems like he's abandoned you, do you go back and remember that he's always come through? That he's always been there. He's always gave you what you needed at that particular moment, in that particular time, at that particular time. It's when we forget that we often fail in our trust in him. Here's the thing, too. As often, uh, and often the faith of our children is weak because they've never been told how great God is and how real His working has been in our lives. Tell your kids. If you don't have kids, tell those young people great things that God, you've seen God do. Those miracles. their testimony, your story. Tell them so that they can have hope, even if they're not believers, even if they're still trying to figure things out. At least in the back of their head, in the back of their minds, they can say, well, if God did it for them, I know that he can do it for me. So tell people, tell people your story, how great God is and what he's done. Every believer, each and every one of us ought to have 
a memorial to call to mind the story of God's work in a world that needs to be passed along. Let me repeat that in case that didn't make sense. We all need to have a memorial that we can tell about, that we can share on how God worked and share it to a world that doesn't know him. Now, memorials don't necessarily need to be physical memorials. They can be memorials invoked by memory. It can be stories of dire situations the Lord has brought them through, tragedies that the Lord has brought them out of, impossibilities the Lord has made possible, and dilemmas the Lord made into deliveries of good things pressed down and running over. We must never forget to tell this kind of story. Had it not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? See, all believers see different parts of the same story. You can't tell in total what the Lord has done for me, and I can't tell you like you can what the Lord has done for you. This is a reason we live in community and we worship together and we fellowship together and we pray for one another. We build one another's faith as we share our story of God's goodness, mercy, and grace. We must never forget to do so. Telling parts of the story helps us to remember our dependence on the Lord of all the earth and our interdependence on one another as prayed for by Jesus, our Lord. See, only, by, only his power allows us to progress. Only his goodness enables us, enables the grace we receive. So let me tell you again, let me emphasize We must tell the story. We must tell the story. Now in verse 12, we read how the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of eastern Manasseh kept their word to Moses and to Joshua. They crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land, ready to fight. And they resolved to stay until the nation of Israel had gained the victory. They knew they wouldn't live on the west side, but because they had promised to fight until the nation of Israel had conquered the west side, what about the northeast? I'm just kidding. Um, They would participate in realizing the promise God gave to their fathers and then go back across the Jordan to rejoin their families on the east side. They knew they couldn't enjoy the blessing of God in fullness until they obeyed the word of the Lord. They were committed to a greater cause which involved helping the nation of Israel achieve its purpose in conquering the land. See, this was God's agenda based on the promise he had made to their forefather, Abraham, over 500 years old earlier. 500 years earlier. So as believers, as Christians, we must be willing to place our agendas beneath the agenda of what is best for the people of God. Egos and narcissism, narcissism, self-interest, self, selfishness, selfish ambition, self-love, all that, the I, the ego, it must be crucified. 
so that our interests are lost in the will of God, so that our interests are lost in the will of God. 1 Peter 3.8, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate. So now I want to move on before I explain more. Uh, read the rest of our passage here. Read the last part of our passage in, in Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, verse 14. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they revered him throughout his life as they had revered Moses. The Lord told Joshua, command the priests who carry the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up from Jordan. When the priest carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant came up from the middle of the Jordan and their feet stepped out on solid ground, the water of the Jordan resumed its course, flowing over the banks as before. The people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern limits of Jericho. Then Joshua set up in Gilgal, Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken from the Jordan. And he said to, is, to the Israelites, In the future, when your children ask their fathers, What is the meaning of these stones? You should tell your children, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord your God did the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until, until we had crossed over. This is so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty, and so that you may always fear the Lord, your God. That day, about 40,000 men of war crossed over and prepared themselves for battle in the plains of Jericho. In verse 14, God does exactly what he said he would do in chapter 3, verse 7. He exalts Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And as a result, the children of Israel had deep reverence and deep respect for Joshua, just like they had for Moses, just like they had for Moses. Verse 19, Joshua and the children of Israel camped at Gilgal, not far from the city of Jericho. The word Gilgal it means roll, R-O-L-L, roll. Gilgal was Joshua's headquarters, like Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters. Gilgal reminded the Israelites that uh, the reproach, the embarrassment, and the shame of their 400 years in Egypt had uh, been rolled away. Had been rolled away. Some of them could remember the slavery in Egypt. Some, after all, had been children during those days that there were slaves in Egypt. And others certainly knew about those stories. Those stories, those memories. Who could forget Pharaoh's genocide attempt when he tried to exterminate their nation by having Hebrew boys drowned in the Nile? Some could remember having to make bricks without straws and probably also remember building those Egyptian palaces, those royal buildings with no pay and no gratification. Perhaps they could still, some of them could still hear the sound of the whips on their parents' bare backs. 
Now, Egypt was synonymous with shame, seemingly invited by Israel's own disobedience to God. However, Gilgal implies the reproach or the shame that has been rolled away. Keep this in mind. If you have to write this down, there's a distinction between shame and guilt. There's a distinction between shame and guilt. Shame is associated with who you are, and guilt is related to what you've done. Shame is associated with who you are, and guilt is related to what you've done. Guilt is a good reaction for the believer who has a healthy conscience. See, when a believer sins, the Holy Spirit convicts them. When you've done wrong as a believer and the Holy Spirit convicts you, it's a good thing. First of all, it means that the Holy Spirit is in you. He's convicting you of sin. Second of all, it, he reminds you. He, the Holy Spirit reminds you that you have someone that died for that sin. And also, it's a good thing because it causes the believer to repent of his or her sin. Shame, on the other hand, it isn't good for believers. It isn't good because it embraces lies about who we are. Think about those things that has always at one time caused you shame. What does it do? It lies to you and tells you that you're that person. Shame has a strong tendency to lie to me a lot. To tell me and remind me of the person who I once was. It's awful. But I remember, I go back and I remember that's not who I am anymore. That person is dead. That person is dead. And now, because of Jesus, I'm alive. A new, I'm a new creation. But again, Shame, don't let shame lie to you. Don't let shame convince you that that's who you are. You're forgiven. You're a child of God. Always remember that. Believers shouldn't be victimized by shame. For we, again, are children of God. Amen. We've been adopted into the family of God. We are born of God. We have, you have a new name, a new role, and guess what? A new home. We shouldn't be people of shame, for we're no longer who we were. We are who we were. We are. Sanctification or Christian maturing is really the process of manifesting who we are in Christ. We hear that word a lot these days, manifesting. Manifesting who you want to be, manifesting your dreams, manifesting your success. There's a lot of YouTube videos on that, and some of them are pretty silly, but... Yes, every single day until I'm here, until the Lord takes me home, while I'm still here, that process of sanctification will be going on 
And once I'm face to face with the Lord, once I'm with him, then that sanctification process is over. But it is. It's a process of manifesting who you are in Christ. As Martin Luther, the great reformer, famously put it, we only advance by going backwards. As we advance in Christ, we do so by remembering. When we sin, we must always return to the fact that we've been baptized. Not simply baptized in water, but baptized in Christ. When Satan tries to accuse us because of sinful acts we've committed, yet repented, we must tell him. We must tell the devil you're a new creation. You're not that person anymore. You must tell him that you've been baptized. We've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We must tell him and ourselves that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We must tell ourselves that even though we may be prodigal sons and daughters, we can go back home to the Father's house, not as hired servants, but as sons and daughters. And oh, my friends, what a great feeling that is, knowing that you can go back as sons and daughters. As one songwriter so aptly put it, I tell him, I'm a wretch undone without his sovereign grace. God saves us through faith in the Son and sends us the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and also subsequently rolling that stone away so that we may declare his excellencies to a world that doesn't know him. Now, the purpose of this astounding miracle is found in verse 24, the final verse of this chapter. The Jordan River crossing, likewise, wasn't simply to establish and exalt a man as the new leader of the Israelites. It wasn't an overt opportunity for God just to put on a show on how powerful he is. Rather, each miracle happened so that all the people of the earth could know the hand of the Lord is mighty and his children are to fear him forever. Let me read that final verse again. This is so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. That, my friends, is the purpose of every believer. Have any of you, any of you ever read the Westminster Confession? I, that's your homework for next week. Read the Westminster Confession. It's, it's pretty awesome. And then learn its history. But in that confession, it asked, it asked the question, what is the chief duty of men? What is the chief duty of man? And the answer is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let me put it another way that maybe makes more sense. What is the main purpose, the goal of a person, of a man and a woman? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. If anybody ever asks you, what is the purpose? What is the goal? What is the meaning? What are we here for? That's the answer there, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 
This, my friends, is our mission. This is why we live. And this is the story we unite to over and over again. And the story that's going to also unite us in eternity. I love that song that played. This is my story. This is my song. Reminds us of this. One day, I believe it could happen at any time. When time will fall exhausted at the feet of eternity. When the new Jerusalem will come down from God out of heaven. A voice will announce, look, God's dwelling is with humanity. And he will live with them. They will be his people peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. That word dwelling in Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 is the same Greek word employed in John chapter 1 verse 14 for, for dwelt which we could translate as tabernacled. Church, God saves us through faith in the Son and sends us the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead so we can declare His excellencies in the world that doesn't know Him. In eternity future, God will tabernacle us throughout ceaseless ages. He will be in our midst. and He will wipe all tears from our eyes. Until that day comes, however, we must continue to tell the story. We must continue to tell the story of how we, you, came out of the river. Don't stop. That's your testimony. That's your story. And guess what? He's still writing it. It's not done. Friends, God brings us out that he might bring us in. And he brings us in so that we might overcome and claim our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Because God's people are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, they have overcome, they they have overcoming power. And the world, the flesh, or the devil need not defeat them. You hear that? Do you understand what I'm saying there? In Jesus Christ, we, you, each and every one of you, are overcomers. If you want to claim your spiritual inheritance in Christ, believe the word of faith and get your feet wet. Step out and walk Step out in a walk of faith, and God will open the way for you. Surrender yourself to the Lord and die to the old life, and he will give you the land and give you days of heaven upon the earth. Again, if you've crossed the river, or you, are, you were crossing the river, so now come out of it. Come out of the river. Claim that promise, that inheritance. You will find the peace that you've been looking for, that you've been searching for. They've been, that's been eluding you your entire life, that 
you haven't been able to get by any other means. Maybe some of you are at the end of your rope. You are at the bottom of the barrel. You have nowhere else to go. Have you tried that narrow road of Jesus? It's a narrow road, yes. But that road will lead to eternal life. It's called a narrow road for a reason. Easy. There's going to be challenges, but always keep in mind that Jesus has overcome. And because he's overcome, you've overcome. You already have the victory. You've already run. You just have to keep going. I mean, you've already won, and you just have to keep going. He has a plan and purpose for you, but it's going to take for you to take that first step, to get up from the mud pit, from the cow dung that you fell into, have to get up, wipe yourself off, and walk into that direction, walk in that direction where, Jesus, where the cross of Jesus is at. You want to be born again. You want to be known as a child of God. You want to receive that promise, that eternal life. Again, I invite you to the cross where you can ask Jesus to forgive you of all your sins. You're watching this for a reason and purpose, and that may purpose may be for this very, for this very, at this very time right now. Don't walk away from it. He's asking you to come to him. ready to do that and you've never prayed before and you want some help in asking Jesus to come into your heart in your life be born again well wherever you're at close your eyes and bow your head and with all sincerity with all your heart pray this Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm not perfect and I've done a lot of harm. Please forgive me. Please forgive me of my sins. I now believe that you died for my sins, that you rose from the dead three days later. And I'll turn from my sins. I repent. I leave them behind and now confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And thank you for saving me. So now, Jesus, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so, he can, so that he can start changing my heart in order for my life to be forever changed. Not because I want my 
marriage back, not because I want my job back. No. So that He, the Holy Spirit, can help guide me and teach me and show me and draw me nearer to God the Father. Show me more about you, Jesus, in my new born again life. Thank you for what you did. In your name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Leave us a comment there on YouTube or on our Facebook page. You, know, you can send us an email um, on, our, from, on our website. Uh, but there's ways to reach out to us. Leave us a message. Send us a letter in the mail if you still like doing it that way. Um, but we just want to glorify God. We want to praise God for what he's done in your life. If you need more information, if you'd like to know more, need more prayer, also reach out to us. You can do that on our website, and again, where you're watching this right now, uh, uh, wherever it may be. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. I pray that you will have a blessed week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.